This is the second segment of the Conversation Carte Blanche interview with Lee Harvey Oswald on radio station WDSU in New Orleans exactly as it was broadcast a few weeks before President Kennedy's assassination. And now back to Conversation Carte Blanche. Here again, Bill Slatter. Tonight, Bill Stuckey and I are talking with three guests, Lee Harvey Oswald, who is a uh, local secretary of a group called Fair Play for Cuba, and with Ed Butler, the executive director of the Information Council of the Americas, and Carlos Bringer, a Cuban refugee, and uh, uh, obviously Andy Castro. Uh, Mr. Oswald, as you might imagine, is on the hot seat tonight, and I believe, Bill Stuckey, you have a question for him. Uh, Mr. Oswald, I believe you said in reply to a question from Mr. Butler that uh, any questions about your background were extraneous to the discussion tonight. I disagree because of the fact that you refuse to reveal any of the other members of your organization, so you are the face of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. Therefore, anybody who might be interested in this organization ought to know more about you. For this reason, I'm curious to know just how you supported yourself during the three years that you lived in the Soviet Union. Did you have a government subsidy? Uh, well, as I... Uh uh, well, I will answer that, uh, that uh, question directly then, uh, since uh, uh, you will not rest until you get your answer. Uh, I worked in Russia. Uh, I was under uh, the protection of the, uh, of the uh, I that is to say, I was not under the protection of the uh, American government, but that is, I was uh, at all times uh, considered an American citizen. I did not uh, lose my uh, American citizenship. Did you say you wanted to at one point, though, or what happened? Well, it's a, a long drawn out uh, situation in which permission to live in the Soviet Union granted to a foreign resident is very rarely given. Uh, this this <coughs> requires a certain amount of technicalities, uh, uh, technical papers and so forth. Uh, at no time, as I say, was I, uh, did I renounce my citizenship or attempt to renounce my citizenship, and at no time was I out of contact or uh, with the uh, American Embassy. I'm Pardon back, me. Uh, Excuse me. May I interrupt just one second? Either one of these two statements is wrong. The Washington Evening Star of October 31st, 1959, page 1, reported that Lee Harvey Oswald, a former Marine of 4936 Collingwood Street, Fort Worth, Texas, had turned in his passport at the American Embassy in Moscow on that same date and had said that he had applied for Soviet citizenship. Now, this seems to me that you've renounced your American citizenship if you've turned in your passport. Well, the very obvious answer to that is that I'm back in the United States. A person who renounces his citizenship, citizenship becomes legally uh, disqualified for returning to the United States. Right, and Soviet authorities, this is from the Washington Post and Times Herald of November 16, 1959, Soviet authorities had refused to grant it, although they had informed him that he could live in Russia as a resident alien. What did you do during the two weeks from October 31st to November 16, 1959? As I've already stated, of course, this uh, whole conversation, and we don't have too much time left, is getting away from the Cuban-American problem. Uh, however, I'm quite willing to discuss myself for the remainder of this uh, program. Uh, as I have sta stated, it is very difficult for a resident, uh, for a foreigner, to, to get permission to reside in the Soviet Union. Uh, during those two weeks and during the date that you mentioned, I was, of course, uh, uh, with the knowledge of the American Embassy, getting this permission. Were you having a building at 11 Kuznetskaya Street in Moscow? Kuznetskaya? Mm -hmm. uh, Kuznetskaya is the, uh, well, that would be uh, probably the foreign ministry, I assume. Uh, no, I was never in that uh, place, although I know Moscow having lived there. Mr. Are Butler, let, the, let, me. let me interrupt, and I think uh, Mr. Oswald is right to this extent. We should get around to Surely. the organization which uh, he is ahead of here in New Orleans, Fair Play for Cuba. Committee. As a, Fair uh, Play for Cuba Committee. As, as a practical matter, Mr. Oswald, uh, knowing, as you, I'm sure you do, the sentiment in America against Cuba, we, of course, severed diplomatic relations some time ago, uh, I, th I would say Castro is about as unpopular as anybody in the world in this country. As a practical matter, what do you hope to gain through your work? Uh, how do you hope to bring about what you call fair play for Cuba, knowing the sentiment? The principles of the fair play for Cuba uh, consist of uh, restoration of diplomatic trade and tourist uh, relations with Cuba. That is one of our main points. Uh, we are for that. I disagree that uh, this... Uh, this uh, situation regarding American-Cuban relations is uh, very unpopular. We are in a minority, surely. Uh, we are, however, not particularly interested in what Cuban exiles or rightist uh, uh, members of uh, rightist organizations have to say. We are primarily interested in the attitude of the United States government toward Cuba. 
And in that uh, way, we are striving to get the United States to adopt measures which would be more friendly toward uh, the Cuban people and the new Cuban regime in, in, uh, in that uh, country. Uh, we are not uh, at all uh, communist controlled, regardless of the fact that I have the experience of living in Russia, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, uh, we have been investigated, uh, regardless of any of those facts. Uh, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is an independent organization, not affiliated with any other organization. Our aims and our ideals are very clear and in the best keeping with American traditions of democracy. Do you agree with uh, Fidel Castro when he, in his last speech of July 26 of this year, he qualified President John Fitzgerald Kennedy of the United States as a ruffian and a thief? Do you agree with uh, Mr. Castro? I would, not agree. I would not agree with that uh, particular wording. However, I and the uh, Fair Play for Cuba Committee does think that the United States government, through certain agencies, namely the State Department and the CIA, has made monumental mistakes in its relations with Cuba, mistakes which are pushing Cuba into the sphere of activity of, let's say, a very dogmatic communist country as China is. Mr. Oswald, uh, would you agree that when Castro first took power, uh, would you agree that the United States was very friendly with Castro, that the people of this country had nothing but admiration for him, that uh, they were very glad to see Batista thrown out? I would say that the activities of the United States government in regard to Batista were a manifestation of not so much support for, uh, for uh, Fidel Castro, but rather uh, a withdrawal of support from Batista. In other words, uh, we stopped armaments to Batista. What we should have done was to take those armaments and drop them into the Sierra Maestre, where Fidel Castro could have used them. As for public uh, sentiment at that time, I think uh, even at that time, even before the revolution, there were rumblings of uh, official comment and so forth from government officials uh, against Fidel Castro. You, you've never been to Cuba, of course, but why are the people in Cuba starving today? Well, in any country, uh, emerging from a semi-colonial state and embarking upon reforms uh, which, uh, which require a diversification of agriculture, uh, you're going to have shortages. After all, 80% of imports into the United States uh, from Cuba were two products, uh, tobacco and sugar. Uh, nowadays, uh, all, while, while, the, uh, Cuba is, uh, while Cuba is reducing its product as far as uh, sugar cane goes, it is uh, striving to grow un unlimited and unheard of uh, for Cuba quantities of uh, certain vegetables, sweet potatoes, lima beans, cotton, and so forth, so that they be can become agriculturally independent. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to interrupt. Excuse Our me. time is almost up. Uh, we've had three guests tonight on Conversation Carte Blanche. Bill Stuckey and I have been talking with Lee Harvey Oswald, Secretary of the New Orleans Chapter of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, Ed Butler, Executive Director of the Information Council of the Americas, and Carlos Bringier, a Cuban refugee. Thank you very much, and good evening. The end of the interview foreshadowed a tragic series of events climaxed by the assassination of President Kennedy on November 22, 1963, and the subsequent murder of Lee Harvey Oswald before a television audience of millions. Now for an impression in depth of Oswald, we turn to one of the panelists on that fateful evening, Edward Butler, Executive Vice President of Inca. Mr. Butler, a specialist in communist propaganda activities and how to overcome them, has interviewed scores of refugees from communist takeovers during the past several years. In 1960, he conceived and now manages Inca and its Truth Tapes program. Truth Tapes are half-hour and 15-minute tape recordings featuring eyewitness refugee testimony about communist takeover tactics sent to a network of over 120 local radio stations in 16 nations of Latin America. The author of several articles on this vital subject, Mr. Butler has appeared as a witness before the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Organizations and Movements to outline ways to win the war of words and avoid nuclear conflict. He was the only known propaganda specialist ever to confront Oswald. Mr. Butler. While sketching the portrait of Oswald for the jacket of this record, I sorted through a metal inventory of scores of memories of Oswald, his expressions, statements, reactions, and gestures. Although our only confrontation was the evening of the debate, I knew a good deal about Oswald before the encounter. 
I had listened for hours to a long tape-recorded interview with Oswald by Bill Stuckey. I had questioned Bringier and other refugees who knew him. I had read the anti-American pro-Castro propaganda Oswald was distributing on behalf of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, and of course I had data about his defection to Russia. We finally met in the reception room at the WDSU studio. Bringier introduced us. Oswald seemed outwardly self-confident, but his hand was clammy when I shook it. I sat down opposite him, about three feet away. Stucky came in, and after a somewhat stiff hello all around, he and I began to chat, while Oswald and Bringier began to argue. When Oswald spoke, he sounded like a man with a piano roll in his head, grinding out the same tired red propaganda tunes that I have heard so often in my work. It was then that I happened to mention to Stucky that a certain local businessman was progressive in his advertising policies. On the first syllable of the word progressive, Oswald abruptly broke off his discussion with Bringier and looked at me, slightly startled. But by the time I had finished the sentence, Oswald realized that I was applying the term progressive to capitalism, and his glance changed into a smirk of utter disgust. To those of us who have to delve into the murky jargon of Marxism-Leninism, Oswald's reaction was no surprise. In the Red Catechism, the term progressive always indicates the proletarian forces led by the party. To apply it to capitalism is blasphemy. I will never forget Oswald's look of loathing. I was to see it several times more during the evening, since everyone noticed that he was particularly antagonistic toward me. I tried to capture that black look on the jacket sketch. It had to be a look of impersonal hatred, since Oswald knew nothing about me or the organization which I represented. But more about that in a moment. I listened closely as Oswald and Bringier resumed their dispute and was impressed by Oswald's technical competence as a propagandist. Let me illustrate with a few examples from the debate you've just heard. Subject paralleling is a standard propaganda technique. On defense, the propagandist uses it to turn an attack backward upon his opponent. Oswald's attempt to use his visit to Russia as a proof that the Fair Play for Cuba Committee is not communist controlled is an example of defensive paralleling. On offense, paralleling is used to link and smear by implication. Oswald did this three times when he labeled me a rightist and anchor a rightist organization. As a matter of fact, he didn't even know the name of my organization when he pulled the parallels because he asked for that information and wrote it down in a notebook when the debate was over. For the record, Inc.'s membership and board includes liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, scattered all over the nation, all bound in their opposition to communist tyranny by a single common ideal, liberty under law. Oswald knew many other tricks of the trade, target narrowing and subject expansion, slogan building, theme repetition, and so on. Here are some examples from the debate. You heard Oswald twice try to narrow his target, a propaganda technique used defensively to avoid dangerous or embarrassing side issues, offensively to sharpen the point of attack. When he said, This I do not think is a, um, a subject to be discussed tonight. Uh, the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, as the name implies, is uh, concerned primarily with Cuban-American relations. And again when he said, Well, I don't think that has a particular uh, uh, import to this discussion. We are discussing uh, Cuban-American relations. Well, and finally when he dismissed the investigative resources of the Congress of the United States with the statement, The Fair Play for Cuba Committee is not now on the Attorney General's subversive list. Any other uh, material you may have is a uh, super Florida. Thus Oswald was trying to narrow my range to courtroom evidence while presumably reserving the broad field of opinion unto himself. Which brings up another interesting point. Oswald also knew how to expand his subject, a method used defensively to blur and confuse the issues so that there is nothing but haze to attack. On offense, expansion is used to make blanket comparisons of charges covering many individuals, groups, or nations. You heard Oswald defensively expanding in answer to my embarrassing question about the difference between Marxism and communism. In just a few sentences, he spanned the globe from Africa to Europe, then tried to bring in American foreign aid and alliance policies to prove his point. Well, the difference is uh, primarily the difference between a country like Ghana, Guyana, Yugoslavia, uh, China, or Russia. 
uh, very, very great differences. Differences which we uh, appreciate by giving aid, let's say, to uh, Yugoslavia in the sum of uh, 100 million or so dollars. I was narrowing on the attack when I refused to be confused and interrupted him with, that's extraneous, what's the difference? The difference is, uh, is as I said, a very great difference. Uh, many parties, many uh, countries are based on Marxism. Uh, many countries, such as Great Britain, display very socialistic uh, aspects and characteristics. I might point to the socialized medicine of Britain. Oswald also used the familiar big lie technique made famous by Goebbels but originated by Lenin and perfected by his successes when he said, The Senate subcommittees who have occupied themselves with uh, uh, investigating the Fair Play for Cuba committee uh, have found that there is nothing to connect the two committees. To anyone who has read the detailed congressional hearings on the Fair Play for Cuba committee, Oswald's distortion is obvious, and I urge every American to get these revealing documents and to decide for yourself. I suppose many mature Americans find it hard to take seriously the Marxian theory of a world split into two warring classes, never changing except by revolution, never progressing except by hatred and conflict. But Oswald took it religiously. Similarly, many Americans can't conceive of anyone idolizing a brutal dictator like Castro, who has left a trail of blood, falsehood, and misery ever since he participated in his first political assassination in Bogota in 1948. But Oswald certainly idolized him. What mystifies Americans most is how an American boy could come to accept such a philosophy and to worship such a man. Oswald himself gave us a vital clue when he said he was introduced to communism by a pamphlet sympathetic to the Rosenberg Adam spies. Later, reading Marx's Das Kapital, he said he felt like a very religious man opening the Bible for the first time. The answer, of course, is that communist propaganda in gradual doses conditions the immature mind to glorify violence. It teaches impersonal hatred of whole classes of humanity. Many communist books, pamphlets, broadcasts, or films are an open invitation to revolutionary terrorism. President Kennedy's death has proved that words, which can be shot around the world faster than any missile, words are the ultimate weapon. What makes these new word weapons so powerful is that they can reach into the midst of any country, manipulate its own people, and invisibly motivate the minds of men who have the power to press buttons and pull triggers. As a professional who handles word weapons every day, in my opinion, the most frightening statement known to man is the bland phrase, it's just propaganda. Propaganda made Oswald the man he was. Communist propaganda inflamed the mind of the man who, evidence indicates, pulled the trigger to fire the bullet that killed the President of the United States. For instance, I have in my hand a cartoon from an official Cuban publication called Verde Olivo, showing President Kennedy wearing a Nazi swastika armband and giving directions to a Cuban refugee leader pictured as a worm. We know, because Oswald admitted it openly, because he recited communist doctrine like scripture, and because people saw him in the act, that he had been steadily absorbing this mental poison for years. Until we counteract the vast bulk of hate propaganda which pours forth both from official communist publications and their echoes here at home like the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, no elected official, no free institution, no private citizen's life, liberty, or property will be safe. But the situation is far from hopeless. Communism can attract only the thinnest minority anywhere. For every embedded Oswald in America or Castro in Cuba, there are thousands of young men all over the world who can be trained to meet, compete with, and defeat them on the mass media battleground. What is needed are professionals, or more accurately, a practical means of subsidizing the efforts of private propaganda professionals for freedom. I emphasize the word private because every red revolutionary from Lenin to Castro to Oswald has worked as a private citizen until after a successful revolution. Here at the private level, using words as weapons, is where most major battles will be won or lost. And here is where nearly every American can help. Only a few will have the inclination, opportunity, and training to wage and win the war of words now going on but all can and must back the attack. 
In buying this Oswald self-portrait in red, you have taken the first step because revenue from this record is helping Inca to combat communism at the private level, professionally, throughout the Americas. I, for one, will never forget these living words, which no assassin's bullet can ever silence. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country.